Olivier Ayotte, uh, just here, and I uh, will be presenting you the result that we have obtained uh, in this uh, few weeks project called uh, Sea on Airborne Laboratory for Canada's North Hydrographic Survey. So um, here is what we have achieved. Um, mainly we have mounted um, a T20P um, MBS system on, a, on an air, a seaplane and we've done two um, high HO spatial road hydrographic survey. And this presentation will show you why we've done that and how we did that. So here is the agenda. So first I will um, uh, tell you about the, the context, the Canada's North Hydrographic context, and then I uh, will explain you the seaplane bathymetry project uh, in more details. So Olivier will uh, tell you about the seaplane setup and uh, I will go forward with the calibration, survey, data processing, QC, and then Olivier will speak to you again with the seaplane uh, step two bathymetry project. So why mapping Canada's north? Basically, uh, there are two main reasons to do that. First, to support Canada territorial claims in the Arctic. And second reason is to secure existing shipping routes or to open new ones for oil and gas projects, mining projects, procurement activities, and cruising ac activities. So that's why um, this study was financed by Transports Canada to explore new way to do uh, hydrography uh, in uh, Canada's north. So to collect hydrographic data in Canada's north is difficult due to access issue. It's far away, and difficult to to ship there. Um, positioning issue because there are um, a two uh, the, the geodesy um, is not uh, highly developed and tide issue because there's no uh, tide models to, to reduce uh, the soundings to a chart datum. In this presentation we just access, we just address the access issue. Um, today <coughs> there are four main platforms to, uh, to go to the north and collect basimetric data. First one is Icebreaker, second one is AUV. You can go there with a uh, helicopter and do spot soundings and use drifting buoy. What we propose today is to, to use a seaplane, to set up the seaplane uh, here in the south, and then to quick mobilize to the north and do hydrography there. So here is the agenda for the seaplane bathymetric project. So first, as I tell you, we, we will show you how we set up the plane, then how we align the system and patch test it. Then I will give you some uh, information on the survey one we did on the lake, then the flight we done on the survey two zone in the St. Lawrence River, and how we data process and uh, do the QC control. So, Olivier. Uh, So my name is my name is Olivier Ayat from Geosphere Aviation, and um, I'm the owner of the seaplane, also an hydrographic surveyor. So it was a, a long time dream for me to put the echo sounder on the seaplane and to try to. Uh, so um, I'm going to uh, describe to you a little bit uh, the installation. So um, for sure we had some a lot of constraint. Uh, to installing such a system on a seaplane. Uh, the first constraint, sure enough, is that we need to have good data quality or else we're doing that for nothing. So, um, uh, to get good data quality, we have to have the transducer at at least 85 centimeter depth, which is for us a major constraint because uh, then the swing arm has to be much longer and it makes more drags and it has to be more solid. Uh, the other constraint also is to keep the weight of the complete assembly as low as possible because we have to take off with that and go to the survey area. Uh, the other constraint also 
uh, the, the whole system has to be very, very rigid in order to give good data quality. It has to be light. Um, it has to be safe also because uh, the major bad luck that could happen to us is that the system will deploy in flight. Then it will be impossible to land safely. Uh, the seaplane will capsize. So we have to make sure that uh, when this assembly is swing back for the flight um, a portion of the survey, we have to make sure that it stays there. So we have a little... Um, so, finally, so um, this is uh, the installation. Here we have the main tube, which is attached to the float of the airplane. At the back here, we have a little wind to bring the swing arm or the complete assembly to the back. Here we have the main uh, transducer assembly and two motor on each side of it. So um, once again, one of the constraints of that system is to keep the weight uh, of the assembly within the weight and balance of the aircraft. If it's too far to the front or too far to the rear, then the airplanes ain't gonna fly the way it's supposed to fly. So that was one of the major constraints to keep the assembly exactly at the weight, uh, at the center of gravity of the aircraft. And sure enough, when it swings back, then the weight shift. So uh, we have to make sure that the weight is, uh, is at the right place when we want to take off with the airplane. Uh, propulsion also is a major <coughs> constraint because sure enough, at first we thought, well, we can just uh, use the propeller of the aircraft while we're on the water to do uh, the line, to navigate on the line. But on freshwater lakes uh, with very small waves, it is possible and it is very easy. But once we get at sea in swell, uh, then uh, the aircraft will pitch into the swell and the prop will hit the, the water, creating damage. Th this damage is a collateral damage uh, to any seaplane operation. Uh, and we know that happens when you take off and when you land. But if you operate one day long, like eight hours a day, in that kind of spray damage, you will ruin uh, the propeller very fast. So for that reason, we need an auxiliary uh, uh, mean of propulsion. We thought that many different options, either ga gasoline engine, electrical engine. It seems we have finally choose two electrical engines at, um, at each end of that um, aluminum pole. The reason being that uh, electric engine, uh, they are very easy, like you, like a gas engine. You have to start it up, and sometimes it doesn't start, and uh, or there's problem, gas contamination, all kinds of problems. Electric, it's very easy. It always goes, and when you want to back up, you just there's a kind of a dimmer, and you just uh, and we choose to have two because we didn't want to have a complete. Um, um, uh, a complete uh, movement or all kinds of pulleys and wire to move the motor, it will have been uh, too fragile if we go in branches or algae. So we choose to have two motors, so then we can have differential thrust to turn the aircraft around and to navigate along the line. Uh, so that's, uh, that's pretty much it for that. So, and also, uh, we have to put shear pins on the system. Because when the, when the system for flight is swing at the back, it's, there's spin and there's um, all kinds of safety to make sure it doesn't deploy. We land on the water, we deploy it, and we lock uh, it in place with shear pins. Because it has to be very, very rigid or else that data is not going to be good. But we have to make sure that if we hit the rock at the bottom, that the pin will shear and the assembly will swing at the back or else it will just tear off the all top of the float, and we don't want that to happen, for sure. Go to the, so here's the, the seaplane. It's a fairly small seaplane, for simple reason that it was the only one we had. <laughs> and because to prove a concept, it's, it's fairly expensive to do that, and it also ruined the aircraft in some sense because you have to drill holes on the floats, you have to drill holes on the airframe of the aircraft to install the rack, you have to modify the electrical system, you have to put the GPS antenna. So all those holes that you make everywhere reduce the value of the aircraft. And sure enough, landing into in waves 
and getting all that pounding these in these out is not good for the airframe it kind of you know so the aircraft will have a limited life also and also operating in salt water is highly damageable for an aircraft so for those it's all those reasons that make that i guess such a system has never been deployed in the past because uh, seaplane owner didn't want to you know uh, go all that extent so we thought we were going to prove the system in a smaller plane and see if there's possibility eventually to go to a bigger plane. So here you see the uh, horizontal uh, boom, which is attached to the two, two float. You got uh, the motor, the transducer, and the winch at the bottom there. And you see here details of the, of the little electrical motor. So uh, at the back of the aircraft, uh, there's an equipment rack which is uh, bolted to the airframe. Uh, we have to re respect certain rules of Transport Canada. Um, when you deal with aircraft, um, usually if it's a certified aircraft, everything has to be made uh, as per uh, an STC or supplemental type certificate. On an aircraft, if you change a boat, you need an STC, you need documentation and drawings. So we have to make sure that everything was made uh, within uh, Transport Canada rules. So here you have the equipment rack and you have the um, uh, inertial station there, which has to be fixed to the airframe. Uh, and you see the frame of reference there uh, to the left. Here you have the, the swing arm with the transducer of the T20P. Um, a reason was uh, gracious enough to borrow us a T20P to prove the system. It's a very, very good um, uh, multibimico sounder. It's light and it's, um, it's a very rugged system and we were very pleased to use it. Um, the uh, transducer boom is a four inch aluminum tube and the horizontal boom is a three inch aluminum tube and they're joined together with a bracket which has a shear pin and then, uh, sure enough, if we hit that, it's going to shoot. And here you see the CPE uh, uh, sensor. That's the, the full rack. The other um, image we have of the rack, it was kind of empty, but now we got a full, uh, a full rack. So here's the laptop to control the system, the power supply, the T20P, which we put backward, uh, so it was much more easy to play with the cables and the uh, inertial system there. Uh, I also have to mention that in order to equip that system, we have to make mo a major modification to the electrical system of the aircraft. Uh, we need to put a bigger alternator because although this thing, sure enough, sucks lots of juice. So um, we have to, uh, there was battery in the floats of the aircraft, but we need to recharge those battery with the alternator of the aircraft. Um, so whenever the battery will go low, we'll start the engine of the aircraft to recharge the battery. Uh, and here's the, um, uh, the way we add, uh, I think it's, mm -hmm. is it yours? Yeah. yeah. I will let them at you. Yeah. So, um, after, after all the uh, seaplane was set up, uh, we do uh, an, an alignment of the system using total station to really well now deliver arm on mounting angles between high new um, uh, T20P and uh, GPS antenna. Then um, we, we've done a classical patch test and we were set up to to try our first survey on the Hill Lake. That's where the seaplane were based. It's close to Rimouski. Um, I'm working for CITCO, which is a research and development center in Quebec. And we are based at uh, Rimouski on St. Lawrence River. And the Hill Lake is a few minutes uh, south from there. So here is the, the first survey that we have, uh, we have realized and th the results. We've obtained uh, here in the left. It's a 3D view in um, Keras uh, software with uh, 10 time exa uh, vertical exaggeration and a, a, a 2D uh, a 2D view uh, at the right. Um, the the area in the south uh, was used to patch test the system because we've got uh, a slope 
which is good to do uh, pitch and uh, yaw calibration. Then, um, so yeah, here is the remote ski on the St. Lawrence River, as I tell you. Um, we fl uh, Olivier uh, fly from a survey one area to survey two area, which is uh, um, just in front of CHS uh, Quebec region offices. So we do this fly, this flight alone. That's why when he land uh, in front of the uh, CHS uh, offices on the bench test area, they they used to calibrate their own uh, vessel. Um, he had to come uh, to the to the beach, and then I would be able to to go in board. And uh, we then um, um, go uh, on the area and put the system uh, in the water and start surveying. Here is the, the result that we have obtained. So again, uh, 10 times vertical exaggeration on the left and um, a plan view on the right. The data processing is classical. We use uh, hips and sips and uh, I would like to thank uh, Caris for the license loan for this project. And so we do have a sulfide definition, some velocity correction, because we've, we've, we have done cast, CTD cast uh, on each site, then water, cor water level correction, sounding, editing, merge and base surface creation. It's important here to notice, to, 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 to keep in mind that no navigation data uh, post-processing have been done. And that explains some bias that uh, we will see uh, um, in, in the presentation after. So now, uh, what's <coughs> it's 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 cool to collect data, but it's um, it's important to uh, to qualify this data. So the vertical precision of the system uh, is uh, is good, and it qualified to the special uh, uh, IHO uh, order. To 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 do that, we we've used a, a square control, and the, the the red lines in the square control were used to create a, a reference surface and the green lines uh, were compared to this uh, reference surface and we obtain the, the graph here, the QC control graph, uh, which show you the vertical uncertainty uh, with reference to uh, each beam. So you can see that the uncertainty is uh, better than uh, 15 centimeters. It's, it's, it's the vertical precision, it's the relative to the system itself. And the horizontal precision was um, um, evaluated um, just by uh, looking for object on the seafloor. Uh, here we can see um, a rock on the seafloor. And this rock is seen the same by two different lines we've uh, run on it. A blue line and a green line. And you can see that the rock appears at the same place. So the horizontal precision is, uh, is quite good. But, but now, let's speak about accuracy. Precision is relative to the system and accuracy is absolute. So if, um, to, to evaluate accuracy, we have compared the two uh, surveys that we have done with reference to a reference surface. On the hill lake, we deployed uh, our uh, own uh, vessel, um, survey vessel here. We have uh, at CITCO, which is equipped with a recent uh, 7125 uh, MBS system with a plan expose MV um, 320. And we do um, this, um, uh, uh, um, this surface, but symmetric surface, which we assume that this is the reference, and we do the same thing at the, uh, on the second uh, area zone, on the CHS uh, benchmark area, with the same board, <coughs> same system, on the area uh, one. So we've got two reference surfaces, and we, we compare the, um, the seaplane surface with reference to the, um, the CITCO uh, survey vessel surface, and we obtain a difference surface, and that gives us the accuracy of the system. Here is the result. 
for the hill lake, we've got a standard deviation about uh, 12 centimeters and 95 percent, and on the um, uh, CHS bench uh, test area, it's about 14 centimeters. Why uh, do we uh, obtain um, such uh, uh, standard deviation? It's because um, mainly because um, the system was not LTK position when we survey, and because we do not uh, post-process the navigation data. That's why uh, you, you can see that here on this slide. Um, again, you can uh, you can see three rocks um, on the right. And the surface is the difference between the reference surface and the seaplane surface. And the rock is not seen uh, at the same place um, with, with the the Citco boat and with the seaplane. It's because the seaplane was not well positioned. I, I repeat again, we were we were not uh, at HK position and no data uh, post processing on navigation uh, have been done. So, in relative way, the system, the seaplane is uh, is good. I show you that. The, in the QC, uh, the, the vertical position, is, the, the horizontal position is, uh, is okay. But in absolute, we are, we've got an offset of about two meters, which is normal. It's when, when the F-180 uh, IMU upper is appeared in standalone mode, it's, it's a precision that we have. So that's why uh, air, the, um, the accuracy, uh, is not so so good, particularly on on slope and on a rocky area, because objects are not well po positioned in the absolute way. But it's easy to, um, to 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 do better to do better. Uh, so, on an hydrographic point of view, the seaplane fitted with a T20. And F-180 produce high quality data, in my point of view. But in order to carry out uh, autonomous commercial hydrographic uh, survey in the Arctic, we need to assess five major problems. And I will let uh, Olivier to, con to conclude and tell you about this um, problem we have to, to achieve in, um, in, a f in a step two. So, um, the, the major goal of that project is being able to take off with a seaplane with enough fuel to go from the base to the survey area, with enough electrical power to uh, power uh, the auxiliary motor and the complete system for five hours on the water, and to carry two person, a pilot and an hydrographic surveyor. Um, that was our goal. Uh, we fail a little bit in that goal uh, in a sense that we cannot carry sufficient fuel and sufficient electrical power in the aircraft and we cannot carry an hydrographic surveyor to go very far away uh, because we're too heavy, the plane is a bit too small. So we have to assess uh, these problems with uh, those. Uh. So first, we have to reduce parasitic, uh, parasitic drag to the bare minimum. So the assembly, uh, the big horizontal tube that uh, sprung again um, in the two floats, it's a round tube because we went that way for economical reason, but a round tube is the worst thing in uh, parasitical drag because it will uh, make a lot of drag behind it. So. Um, to, uh, avoid, um, to avoid that, we have to replace all the tube of the assembly by struts. A strut is shaped like a water drop, and it is the shape who has the less uh, hydrodyna um, aerodynamic uh, resistance. So, and also, the motors, they are outside, and they are also very draggy. So we have to build little fairings around the motor, uh, so then when we are in flight, uh, they are not so draggy. Same thing for the transducer, we have to build a fairing around it to reduce drag. Also, we have to reduce the overall weight of the system. Uh, we have to reduce the overall weight of the system. Um, we have, maybe, uh, it will be good if we can avoid having an hydrographic surveyor. Um, 
and to uh, reduce the workload of the single pilot operator, what we can do is to transmit uh, data in real time through a satellite data link uh, to the office. So the hydrographer can be sitting in his office and looking at the data in real time instead of being sit uh, in, the aer in the airplane. Uh, provide enough um, electric power for the system and motor uh, <coughs> to be able to survey for five hours at five knots. And uh, we have to improve the rough water landing and uh, takeoff and navigation capability of the system. Um, so, sure enough, the simplest way to assess all those problems is to get a bigger boat or a bigger plane in that case. Uh, but we only have the Super Cub for now. So, and without um, uh, assistance of a, uh, an investor, uh, we will have to find ways to go around those problems with our small plane. Um, one of the, the ideas, as I was saying, is to build fairing uh, around the motor and the transducer uh, and to replace all the tube by strut shape uh, component. Also, one of the ideas to reduce the drag is instead of having the motor at the outside exposed to the airflow, is to have the motor inside the float, uh, a little bit like a sea dew or like a so there will be an intake of water and the water will be in the float and uh, push water out at the back of the float. Uh, also, one of the things we were thinking is to put the transducer at the bottom of the float, uh, once again to avoid having a structure of tube which is heavy and draggy. But there's a problem with the depth of the transducer, but uh, we'll see about that if we get there. So uh, also, all the SMD is made of aluminium. In the next uh, system we will be building, it will be all replaced by titanium, which is stronger and lighter. And um, also, we will be using a shorter cable on the T20P. Uh, we had quite a long cable, which was weighing, I think, 30 pounds. Uh, and we didn't need uh, all that length. But, um, to reduce the workload of the single pilot, as I was saying, we will try to use uh, real-time data transmission. Uh, so a remote operator can be checking data in real time at, in the hotel room. Also for the power, uh, this summer test we were using battery to power the motor and the system and we find out that uh, they were dropping much faster than we thought they were with our calculation. So the next system we will be using a small generator that will be uh, mounted inside of a belly pod at the bottom of the uh, belly of the aircraft. And that will, and we might even try to feed gas to the generator from the gas tank of the aircraft. Uh, also, to um, uh, to get a better stability on the water, we are thinking about putting some sponson at the wingtip and at the tail of the aircraft. So when we are in swells, uh, the aircraft doesn't capsize. Uh, the, so, but basically, this project should be considered as a success because we, up, or we uh, achieved the major goal that we were thinking for that uh, testing phase, which is uh, take off with a complete Mitsubishi Miko Sander, land at sea in uh, uh, 75 centimeter of waves, uh, perform Mitsubishi uh, sounding a uh, hydrographic survey to the IHO standard, and um, yeah, but uh, we were not capable of carrying enough fuel and enough battery and the hydrographic surveyor to do a real uh, commercial survey. So we have to uh, optimize the system in for the next season. So that's uh, pretty much it. And just the, maybe a very, very short add-on. Uh, those are the rules of certification. There's uh, three basic kind of aircraft that we can use for that kind of uh, of project, um, home-built aircraft, then we don't need no certification from Transport Canada, all the mods are approved by the owner, but uh, when we are in flight, the pilot has to be alone in the aircraft, no system operator, because it's the rule with home-built aircraft on commercial operation. Uh, then we can use a next military aircraft, then all the modifications are approved only by an aircraft maintenance organization, so it's very easy and it could be operated commercially with the system operator or hydrographer aboard. 
uh, or we use a certified aircraft, but then all the modification has to be approved by a design approval uh, representative, which would be very expensive, and commercial ops are approved with an IDO reference system operator. And yes, that's pretty much it. Okay. Thank you. Uh We have time for a quick question. What type of batteries did you use to power the motors? Uh, the question was, what kind of batteries did they use to power the? Uh... Actually, we uh, we were using um, standard lead acid battery, um, but a very very high quality uh, brand, which are called North Star. But at first, we were supposed to use. Um, uh, ion, uh, uh, yeah, uh, lithium ion battery. We had asked the company that built them, uh, Master Vault, uh, to borrow us a pair of battery. They were supposed to, but finally we didn't get them. They're very expensive, but apparently they will have had give us 10 times uh, the power of the lead acid battery. There are some problems with lithium batteries in airplanes, I think. <laughs> exactly. The, the major problem. Yeah, it's uh, it's power. Yeah. Did you ever consider an above wing seaplane powered the propellers above wing? Uh, you mean like a um, uh, groom and goose or? Uh, yes, uh, lots of people have been telling us that it would be much better because those uh, seaplane are made to land at sea, where a float plane like the one we use is much more built to go in freshwater lakes and river. So uh, for sure a groom and goose or some kind of, uh, uh, that kind of seaplane will be better, but they are very, very expensive. That's the issue with uh, many hydrographic surveys. A lot of times you're limited by what your budget is and you end up being very creative with your engineering based on the platforms available. So no, that was excellent talk. Thank you, both of you.